The history of these villages is one of war, with a growing population where finding enough food depends on controlling a large area of forest. The tribesmen have always fought for survival in the most literal sense. The prows of their canoes are carved with representations of their spirit protectors. Ochenap has a population of about 1,500. During the day, it's a peaceful place. The men are out hunting, and the women and children share the daily tasks between them. The youngest children have a perfect playground in the soft mud of the river bank. Houses are built on stilts. The level of the river can rise suddenly during the wettest part of the year. Women collect firewood and prepare the evening meal as they wait for the men to come home from the forest. But as evening approaches, the women and children have a very important duty to perform when the men return. pretend to attack them, hurling mud and rocks and launching spears and arrows. Men too old to go hunting join in. Some of the Asmat say that the purpose is to show that the guardians of the village are alert while the men are away. Others that the mock attack trains their men to avoid the enemy's arrows in a real battle. There's probably a bit of both in it. And nowadays, it's fun. But it wasn't always a game. Today, there's a reminder of the bad old days. The men are carrying a large log from the forest. Less than 10 years ago, the ceremony that follows would have been an ominous event. The song praises their ancestors and tells the story of how the Asmad began. Their original founder was born from mud on the river bank. His first act was to carve a man and a woman from a tree and breathe life into them. These two are the mother and father of the whole tribe. Now the men are carving images of their ancestors into the log to commemorate their origins. carving goes on for a week. The men are in formal battle gear and they act as if they're in a trance. There's no discussion, no master plan. Each just carves as the spirit moves him. The finished carving is coated with the white clay that they use to paint themselves. And the individual faces are given nose ornaments, the badge of a successful headhunter. When the pole is complete, they bring it out for the ceremony. Not long ago, this was to boost the morale of the warriors before they went out on a headhunting expedition, a vital part of the funeral rites when an important warrior in their own village died. They knew that some of them would not return. In those warlike forays, looting was forbidden, punishable by death. Their sole aim was to bring back one or two heads to appease the departing spirit. The neighbors would similarly attack them without warning. This was why they lived in fear. The climax was to release the first symbolic arrows of the coming fight. They hail 
the spirits of their ancestors with a final chant and an address in their praise from the tribe's leader. Headhunting has now ceased. The rituals associated with it carry on to honor the ancestors, but without the terror that they once aroused. Poles from earlier ceremonies guard the entrance to the village. As night falls, the villagers prepare for a foraging trip into the forest in the morning, no longer fearing a sudden attack from their neighbors. They wade through the mud from which they were born in search of the tree that gives them life. It's the sago palm whose thick, starchy inner flesh provides their staple diet. A long day's work provides enough food for four families for a week. The men break down the fibers with axes and mallets. The women's job is to free the starch from the fiber by soaking it in water and squeezing it. They collect the resulting liquid in a trough made of bark, ready for the next stage of its preparation. Fallen sago palms provide not starch, but protein and fat. They always contain a few palm beetle larvae. In a forest like this, where large animals are scarce, insects are an important source of food. The boys have found the nest of a megapode, a bird that builds a natural incubator in the soil in which to lay its eggs. They'll take them home for dinner. But not before they have given thanks to the spirits of the forest for their good fortune in finding them. The sago starch has settled in the trough and is ready to take home. Heated, it produces a sticky, filling food. The leaves of the palm are used to make a rucksack in which to carry the rations home. Each bundle weighs about 10 kilograms, a good day's work. Back at the village, the families gather for the evening meal. Four families live in each house. There are no partitions between the living areas, though each has its own fireplace. The Asmat Stone Age period is long gone. 
partly through enforcement by the government, but mainly through trade with other tribes that have more contact with the outside world, they have abandoned their headhunting past and joined the plastic age with the rest of us. But they still like a juicy beetle grub with their sago. <laughs> Everyone in the family, men, women and children, receives an exactly equal share of the food. The megapode egg, hard-boiled, is carefully shared out. Night falls early in the forest, and by eight o'clock the people are asleep. Although the government, backed by missionaries, confiscated the trophies held by the tribes, there are other reasons for keeping the skulls in the house. This man's nephew died of malaria seven years ago. The boy shared his food with him and brought him fish from the river. He was such a favorite nephew that after a suitable period of mourning, his uncle dug up his burial mound and removed the skull. Now he decorates it and carries it wherever he goes. Seeds and shells embedded in pine resin fill the empty eye sockets. When morning comes and the family go out foraging, the nephew goes too. The Asmat have a strong sense of the continuity of the spirit world. When someone who should have been a descendant becomes an ancestor, his spirit is doubly to be respected. The Asmat live a remote enough life in their forest, but 300 kilometers further inland, between two great rivers, lies the territory of the Korowai, a tribe that is truly still in the Stone Age. They build their houses on tall stilts, well clear of the forest floor, sometimes as much as 30 meters above the ground. It's cooler and less humid up here. <laughs> 